eight really fast cores or 12 slower cores? Well, that's the $450 question, right? Usually the recommendation goes productivity, more cores, gaming, faster cores. But is the answer really that simple? Let's dig a little deeper. Welcome to Machines and More. All right, two really incredible AMD processing machines up for comparison today. And this video will also serve as the full review for the 5800X. We've been looking at cooling options and it's been a lot of content recently. The 5800X is the latest eight core 16 thread CPU from AMD featuring the Zen 3 architecture. And the 3900X is the previous Zen 2 generations, 12 core, 24 thread powerhouse. Now it might seem odd to be comparing these two CPUs, but that's commonly done right. Previous gens Ryzen 9 versus the current gen Ryzen 7. And given the spotty availability of Ryzen 5000, and also the fact that the 3900X is still a current SKU at a similar pricing to the 5800X, there might be some prospective buyers out there cross shopping the two. And I think it's a relevant comparison. So today let's see if it's as simple as the 3900X for productivity and the 5800X for gaming. So 5800X here, 3.8 gigahertz base clock, 32 megabytes L3 cache. It's spec to boost up to 4.7 gigahertz on a single core. But in practice, I've seen it easily exceed that on stock behavior, closer to 4.85. The Zen 3 architecture offers a significant improvement as high as 19% on an instructions per cycle basis. So even at identical clock speeds, there is a noticeable jump over Zen 2. The 5800X has the same base clock speed as the 3900X, but the 3900X only has a boost clock of 4.6 gigahertz on a single core. But in real world use, I've really never seen that. It boosts up to 4.5 gigahertz at most on its stock behavior. 64 megabytes L3 cache, but that's because this one is a dual CCX CPU. And before we jump into the performance comparisons, let's just do a quick rundown on test specs. I am testing in the NR200 with the RTX 3080 FE. ASUS B550 ITX motherboard, 16 gigs of 3200 megahertz RAM and the cooler down to the fan speeds are identical with the MA612 and they are identical to ensure that the only variable here is the CPU. I do present a benchmark with the curve optimizer for the 5800X enabled, but since that is a silicon dependent adjustment, the benchmarks shown here are all stock with auto PBO enabled. All right, so Cinebench should give us a very good idea of what each CPU is good at. For R20 in multi-core, the 3900X is well ahead of the 5800X, and then we see a flip-flop where we cut over to the single core performance. Same story in R23, more cores smokes less cores, no surprise there, and better cores destroys weaker cores in single core metrics altogether. Enabling Curve Optimizer and tuning the CPU yields even more performance on the single core level for the 5800X. Here it's set up with a plus 200 megahertz max boost and a negative 10 offset for Curve Optimizer and the chip occasionally boosted into the five gigahertz space. It's uh, very impressive here. 3D Mark Time Spy shows a very close result. The 3900X is ahead here. A multi-threaded intensive render like Blender is where the 3900X excels. So a 75 second gap here is the high end example of the productivity differences between the two. Some processes are core performance dependent more than core count. So on Blackmagic's raw speed benchmark, the 5800X is a good bit faster. When using the CPU to render out an exported video in DaVinci Resolve 16, the 3900X does have an advantage, although whether or not a 10% or so advantage is of material significance in the real world is definitely user dependent. And with the standard Puget Systems DaVinci Resolve benchmark, the two are essentially evenly matched. Moving on to some gaming benchmarks, here I am testing at three different resolutions to show the impact as the GPU becomes the limiting factor. So let's just start with a few games where the CPU is typically a limiting factor. Far Cry 5 running on DX11 will show the limit of the 3900X. It tops out at about 120 FPS or so, and we know that because 1440p and 1080p results are identical. And for the 5800X, we do see about a 20% gain overall. However, when the GPU is the limiting factor, like at 4K, there shouldn't be a meaningful difference. 
Similar story for Microsoft Flight Simulator. The 3900X does appear to top out at about 64 FPS since 1080 and 1440p results are the same, while the 5800X does still yield higher frame rates at 1080 than 1440. And while the gap is smaller at 1440, it is about 30% at 1080. So quite a sizable advantage if that's your resolution. So for games that are CPU dependent, expect a good gap. Well, what about GPU bound games? Well, in those scenarios, you may not see a meaningful difference at all. Take a look at a very GPU dependent title in Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Essentially the frame rate differences here are run to run variances and for practical purposes, they are identical, whether at 1080, 1440 or 4K. A similarly GPU dependent title in Red Dead 2 does show a slight, albeit insignificant advantage for the 5800X at the lower resolutions, but that is non-existent at 4K. And for a last gaming benchmark, let's take a look at the Civ 6 Gathering Storm AI turn time benchmark, where a lower number indicates better CPU performance. Here the 5800X absolutely destroys the 3900X because core count isn't as important for this particular aspect of gaming, uh, whereas core quality is. Power consumption for gaming at 1080 is pretty similar, along with a stock 3080 Founders Edition card. The power draw at the wall is around 400 watts. Thermals for these two CPUs with identical cooling are different, and despite being the difficult chip to cool for Zen 2, the 3900X does come in at a noticeably cooler temp for an all-core workload like Blender. Now a lot of this has to do with how densely packed the 5800X is and cold plate quality is very important in order to allow the heat to be transferred away from the IHS. Alright, so you've seen the results and while I think the generalization to go one way for gaming and one way for productivity is fine, I think we could be a bit more specific on that since it kind of depends. Uh, for heavily multi-threaded applications, I think it's realistic to expect a 15 to 18% performance benefit from the 3900X, but for less heavily multi-threaded ones, you might see performance that is pretty similar between the two. For gaming, the performance gap is noticeable, 20 to 30% in scenarios that are CPU dependent to practically nil for GPU limited scenarios. The reason the 5800X is tricky is because of its price position relative to the 12 core 5900X, which is only $100 more at retail, and because it is $150 more than the 5600X, which yields similar gaming performance. And to be fair though, that conundrum isn't unique to the 5800X. It's always going to be a question for your Ryzen 7 and your i7 SKUs. That means that the value makes sense for someone who wants the gaming performance and has some need for multi-threaded performance where it does trounce the 5600X by about the 30% you'd expect from having two extra cores. There is the consideration that new 8-core consoles will bring about more use for those two extra cores with the generation of games to come. But unless you plan on using the chip for five years or more, you might never see that assertion come to fruition. For this category of moderate power user, the CPU gets close enough to the 3900X while offering something vastly more useful in the gaming department. And with the enormously high power draws from Intel's 11th gen, I don't think the 11700K is a worthwhile consideration next to the 5800X. So while this price bracket is an odd niche to fill, there also really isn't anything like the 5800X either. In the sub $500 space now, if your needs are heavily workstation based or if you have virtualization needs, then just go with the 3900X. If they are critically demanding, then you know. Uh, and then the extra for the 5900X may be worth considering for you. But if you can't use that extra performance, why spend a dime more on that performance? If what you want is a little more oomph than six cores and 12 threads and you need the gaming performance, if you need a CPU right now, and if you have an above average budget, this is your CPU. And yeah, that's a lot of ifs, but do I recommend it? Absolutely, for this unique category of user, I would choose it over the 3900X. I personally really like the overclocking and undervolting feature from Ryzen 5000's PBO2 curve optimizer. And even though next to the 3900X, this is slightly more challenging to keep cool, your large tower or 240 AIO is still sufficient. 
If gaming is what matters and you're heavily GPU limited, then heck, even a 3600 or an i5 11400 will do just fine right now. And that price bracket isn't remotely close to this one. So just do that and get a better GPU. And unless you're willing to wait to see if a 5700X appears, which is really doubtful given the current microchip production environment, grab this one if you find it available. And the good news is when it has come in stock, it is a lot easier to buy it. And often it stays in stock for a while. All right, so that'll wrap up this review. If you recently made this decision, please share which one you went with in the comments down below. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And I've gone ahead and left some product links for your reference, so please check those out. Thanks for watching today, and I'll see you again soon. Thank you.